All right. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Love the Fuel show. So today, once again, I'm always finding these amazing new guest co-hosts to have a chat with. And uh, we might be talking a little bit about healthy mindset today, maybe ways to improve our healthy lifestyles, because uh, the gentleman I'm bringing on happens to be a doctor. Uh, but more importantly, after I've learned more about him from information that was sent to me, he, he's obviously he's a doctor. He's an artist. He's also an explorer. This guy's been around the block. And, but right now, with everything going on with the COVID, the, the, the worldwide pandemic, and there's a lot of choices in life of positive and negative influences. And I'm actually excited to dig into that with him because there's a bit of a well, – I mean, obviously, the COVID is, is branded as a crisis. Uh, but there's also apparently this a, a three-paradigm shift that he's pretty much an expert in and helping us understand. So I'm excited to bring him on because we're already streaming this live in the Facebook world on Live the Fuel. And then obviously we're going to rush this up in production and see if we can get ahead of some other shows we already have in the tank. So uh, again, he knows a little bit about indoor air emergencies, uh, viruses. He's an ER expert. Uh, he's actually about to tell you guys about some radical transparency when it comes to media, but also some interesting things around healing our, our race uh, relations as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Jeff Gusky, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be with you, and I hope that you're safe and your audience is safe. Absolutely. I mean, my wife and I are health and fitness nuts, and uh, she's been essential this whole time. You and I were talking before the show just now that she's a veterinary doctor, and she has had nothing but busyness. Uh, farms and their animals still need to be taken care of. So, And luckily, I'm in the online space, so i just been stuck in my home office a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But I understand the importance of indoor air quality because um, I have some very high-end uh, HVAC-related uh, UV equipment installed because I actually train companies on indoor air quality and that UV technology, no which is a company that we represent for one of my clients. So I've been wow. stuck running webinars probably. Last week I ran nine webinars for nine different companies and contracting companies across the Northeast on understanding UV for HVAC. So I know you know a little bit about humidity, and, and yes. air so yes yeah i figured i'd throw that out there for you help kind of kick things yeah. off <laughs> yeah that's great yeah so so let, let's let's dive in i mean first of all real quick on the backstory i, got, I gotta tie this in the whole national geographic factor what got you to go there i mean just well, decide to get a little more ask, adventure you, no no not exactly people you know there's something iconic about the national geographic role at, you know being a national geographic photographer you know the clint eastwood role in uh, bridges of madison county or you know going back in time and and so people often ask well how do you become a national geographic photographer and my answer is that you don't you <laughs> there it's a it's a bureaucracy that is almost impossible to uh, get through mm -hmm. um, they have to almost find you and so that's what happened in my case is they were looking for me because they learned about my work on a hidden world of World War I. And we, this was about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, something like that. I've been doing this for about 25 years and wow. had two lives as a fine art photographer and a practicing emergency physician. And fortunately, with emergency medicine, when you're done with your shift, you're done and you can have a separate life. So there are ER docs who are pilots and dancers and you know, Broadway actors and authors, and I'm a National Geographic photographer. And uh, This doesn't surprise me, by the way, because I have a friend of mine who I've known for years. Uh, he's, a, he's a head oncologist at a local hospital here. And I, I used to help run a small charity locally here years ago, and we used to raise money for his cancer vaccine research. But then all of a sudden, a couple of years ago, he happened to reach out to me on a personal note and said, hey, you know, I'm looking to launch this brand thing online. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're an oncology doctor. He's like, yeah, but I also love photography, as you just pointed out. And he actually got into glass blowing, hmm. and he found a way to – he went and found an expert in training. And for years, I had no idea. He just had his own art shows this past year, everything. He's found a way to fuse, like, molten glass and mineral, minerals, mineral, rich mineral deposits into art. And I was like, this guy – granted, his kids are like – they work for NASA and I mean, it's a real smart family, but it was just cool finding this whole other side of his life to help that he created because he needed that balance was what he taught me. He needed yeah, that balance well, when you're unplugged. 
you're, he's lucky to encounter you or, you know, you can help him to bring this to the world. And in my case, I think it's more of a calling. You know, I, I find myself almost feeling like I'm a pawn in a, in a chess game of the universe, you know, where uh, I, at least I don't take credit for the things that I've done. Enti I take some credit, you know, because I work very hard. Mm -hmm. And, and strive to achieve very high goals. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of mystery to the things that I've found and explored and been involved with. So um, the, uh, the story begins 25 years ago when I stumbled onto a hidden world of the Holocaust. I was the first fine art photographer to go behind the former Iron Curtain and document this hidden world of World War II yeah. that had been frozen in time behind the former Iron Curtain for a half century during the communist era, after right. the Nazi era. And, and so it was a direct connection in the raw to modern mass destruction. And that began a quest to understand why mass destruction and terrorism is with us still. And that has kind of uh, been the, the passion of my life since. And, and so uh, the National Geographic piece came in when I, and there were several big projects between then and now. I mean, that, that first project ended up becoming a traveling exhibition and known around the world and on Broadway and, um, and, uh, and then, uh, Fast forward to the most recent endeavor, which began in 2010, at the end of 2010, almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so I ended up stumbling onto a hidden world of World War I. Now, is that what's on, the, on your main website? Actually, I'm going to screen share real quick. It's yes. super cool. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, jeffgusky.com, ladies and gentlemen. But that, I, I'm like, that is a powerful image. Yeah, that, that, here's the story behind that image. So my work ended up being the centerpiece of the coverage of the 100 year anniversary for the Smithsonian Institute with an 18 month ex exhibition mm -hmm. at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington on the mall. Yeah. And the chief curator asked me to photograph the, the entryway uh, photograph. Okay. And, and so I, it was a big responsibility because you know millions and millions of people go through that museum. It's the most visited museum in the world. And, and so this photograph ended up being 17 and a half feet wide. <laughs> and, and I pictured, I didn't know how to, to create it. I had it in my mind. Right. And, and so I went to a, a specialty photographer named Harold Ross who is in Pennsylvania in the Amish country, south yeah. of, of uh, Hershey, or isn't that south of Hershey? Well, that whole region, that's where my parents or, or actually Harrisburg moved to. Or, yeah. yeah, there's a Lancaster County region, a Lebanon County region, full of Amish and Mennonites uh, between from Hershey to Harrisburg, that whole area, yeah. So, so I went to, uh, for two sessions of boot camp, one-on-one -on -one for three days, and he's grueling, and he kicks your rear end. And if, if you have an ego as a doctor, forget about it. <laughs> he breaks you down and builds you up. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And, and so he, he taught me this very exacting technique of photographing in complete darkness. So that picture that you just showed was um, photographed using this special technique. It's not Photoshopped and wow. manipulated in the sense of creating something that wasn't there. It's all that is there. And so you shot this like at night? In the middle of the night. Wow. And in fact, and it took hours and some friends from Dallas came over and we had wine and cheese at three in the morning in that bunker, uh, the first bunker, when you look to the left. Yeah, and I, I hear really these, uh, the tunnel accesses. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, these tunnel accesses well, right not, here on the left? They're not tunnel accesses, they're just bunkers, but oh. they're original. Okay. And this is a place that still exists and they still find human bones from 102 years ago. Wow. They come up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so surreal that you still have remnants from so long ago because the, 
magnitude of mass destruction is beyond human comprehension when you have millions and millions and millions of people that die in this kind of narrow 450 mile line called the Western Front. Hmm. And, and so seven miles north of there, and I didn't, or did I know it? I guess I did know it at the time, but, but didn't know a whole lot about what I'm gonna share with you now. So seven and a half miles north, no, actually I didn't know it at the time, what I'm gonna share. So is, is a very important place. Out in the middle of nowhere, in a farm field, is sacred ground for America. And that's one of the two parts of the Smithsonian show that I'm now part of at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So I'm honored to participate in a second Smithsonian show and it will be up through September 6th, if anyone's in DC. Okay. It's the, the big new Smithsonian Museum near the White House. And they took out Oprah's exhibit and put this exhibit in. So that's so, a big deal. No offense to Oprah, but <laughs> I mean, hey, I mean, clearly you must have you must have helped uh, document something pretty powerful. If they're well, going to do that. I, I'm very lucky to be part of it. So it turns out that that seven and a half miles north of that place is what is the only surviving trace of a black combat unit from World War One. Oh wow! The underground command post of a unit called the Black Devils. And so it's an amazing story that unites America around race. So imagine seven and a half miles north of that picture. And, and what also happened um, is that uh, in, in this farm field is the only, it, it's the place where something happened that's never happened before or since. And that is that Two African-American heroes both die in the same battle, both nominated for the Medal of Honor, and it was covered up. And then on a hilltop in the mud, unmarked right now, a kilometer from where those two heroes died, is a monument that these heroes paid for a dollar a man and placed at the end of the war in 1918. And on that monument are the names of the two Medal of Honor nominees. Wow. Who were these guys? They were cotton pickers from South Carolina. Okay. They lived in a time where they had absolutely nothing to look forward to, but Jim Crow, lynching, the Klan, no veterans benefits, no civil rights laws, no safety net, nothing. And yet it was their country and they died for it, they were stakeholders. Yeah. They, it was theirs and, and, they, and they did some, something extremely heroic. And so one of them would become the first African American to receive a Medal of Honor in 1990 when his paperwork supposedly resurfaced mm. during the first Bush administration. From World and no War one knew about to the all the way to 1990, wow. In 1918, to, it, was, it was 72 years after he died wow. that he got the Medal of Honor. But no one knew that there was a second hero. And his story is even more heroic than the man who got the Medal of Honor. His, can I just tell you a glimpse? It, Absolutely, it, yeah. Okay. So now, I want to go, now I want to go to DC. <laughs> I mean, this, the, is, uh, this is powerful. So it, it, I just get goosebumps when I think about it. Yeah. Um, so the first man who got the Medal of Honor, his name was Corporal Freddie Stowers. Oh. And he did something heroic. These, this small Company C of the 371st Regiment, which was a, a regiment of cotton pickers, all black soldiers, all white officers from South Carolina, they got caught in an ambush. The Germans lured them in. It was called a comrade trap. It was, it was bestial and cruel and murderous. And half the unit went down in the first minute. And oh. uh, Corporal Freddy Stowers was mortally wounded. He was not coming back, but he kept fighting and took out a machine gun nest, led his soldiers, and then he, he died on the battlefield. There was no way he was going to make it. But that was his heroism. Wow. No one knew about a second hero. And, and his name was Private Burton Holmes. 
And he did something that inspire us all to know what it means to be an American, especially in a time like now. So he, and this is directly from the 1918 paperwork nominating him for the Medal of Honor, which I believe was downgraded for political purposes. So one, one of the medals was downgraded, the other one the paperwork was supposedly lost because imagine what would have happened to the myth of Jim Crow if the, the story of two African-American heroes both nominated for this most prestigious medal in our country's um, uh, History, yeah. ranks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would have shattered the myth of Jim Crow. It would have made it look silly. So, so Burton Holmes, he's badly wounded. His weapon jams. He comes back through a hail of machine gun fire and shelling to the safety of the command post where he could have been treated and lived. Okay. He refuses treatment. He gets a fresh weapon, goes back again through the hail of machine gun fire, cross inflating fire and mortar fire. Wow. Right to the front line where he fights until he dies. He makes a choice that goes deeper than race or class or education or material wealth that unites us all as Americans. Yeah. True yeah. sacrifice for something he believed in. Give me some chills and goosebumps right now. And, and then it gets better because um, no one knew that they did something more than just contributing a dollar a man voluntarily to have this monument made, which is now on that muddy hilltop, unmarked in France. I found a book in a public library that hadn't been checked out in a long time, written in 1928 by a white captain from that unit. Mm -hmm. And looking in the back of the book in the appendix, I learned they also contributed 75 cents a man to a medallion. Mm -hmm. And I've so far found five of them. One of them I donated to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and it's right now in the show. Oh, wow. And, and this medallion tells us everything we need to know about how they saw themselves as Americans and as men. Because what this is about is not to impress white America on anything. It's how they saw themselves as Americans, right. as patriots. So when you look at the medallion in the middle, in a small scale, hunched over in the hot sun is a man and a woman picking cotton. So this is about family. It's the world they left behind. And right next to them is a log cabin, a sharecropper's cabin, and the palmetto tree, which is the symbol of South Carolina. Oh, yeah. I lived there briefly. I'm very familiar. Okay. Yeah, so Greenville, then, Greenville you know, South Carolina. So... In much larger scale, at the top of the medallion, you see the future, which is a proud, forward-leaning African-American soldier in uniform leading a bayonet charge. Oh, wow. And then underneath at the bottom are the words in Latin, how sweet and noble it is to die for our country our country wow that's symbolic that's powerful and so this medallion no one knew about it they, they, multiple of them multiple of them exist or they are each each one they, of a kind or they're all they had 2000 minted in 1918 okay. i have found five they're very rare sounds like you it. Can't, you, yeah I, I don't know if i'll ever find any more but um it, it's it just it shows us how these heroes felt about themselves and there was a reverence between the white officers and the african-american soldiers it's the opposite of what you would think from a a racist south carolina deep south mm -hmm. and even after the war for 10 years or more they had reunions and you see letters back and forth and you see 
a respect and a love and a, a passion for this moment in time where they expressed what it was to be an American. I, I love the symbolism of that because it is true that when, when you serve and you risk your lives together, and again, I never served in the military, but I yeah. had that brief part of my story, that brief stint as a federal wildland firefighter, I didn't, I didn't have any uh, you know, black, black guys on my crew, but I had uh, actually uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, five of my fellow firefighters were from five different tribes around North America. And I mean, they were leaving their families on the reservations to come out and serve alongside of us and risk their lives together. So we didn't care what color you were or what, where you came from. Actually, I enjoyed it because I got to hear about all these other lifestyles that I never experienced, you know, as a white guy from the Northeast. So, uh, you know, everybody actually thought it was hilarious that some guy who was born in New Jersey was out fighting wildfires. They thought I was the weirdo. <laughs> so so, so uh, let, me, was, let me share. That's yeah. a great, yes. We're talking about the same thing. And you, yeah. Can I just close the loop on that? Yeah, please. Okay, so it, it comes from what I've seen in the ER and also on the front lines of exploring remote corners of Europe and the former Soviet Union where millions have been murdered in modern times in, in the work on the Holocaust and in World War I. So what you find are in, in moments of crisis, if someone of a different race or background has just saved your life, you don't see race, you see human. And it never leaves you. you. The rescuers are as moved as those they rescue. Complete strangers risk their lives to save the lives of complete strangers. It's not about having a PhD or education or something up here, it's about fear. It comes spontaneously and and we see it in 9-11 moments we see it in hurricanes we see it now in in the most massive way before all this anarchy what we saw and and i had the honor to be part of this are tens of thousands of first responders and healthcare workers putting their lives on the line every day they went to work Yep. not knowing if they would catch a disease that would kill them or they would come home and infect their families. But I, not, I know of not a single case where anyone called off from work. I know of not a single case of racism. People were putting their lives on the line for each other. It's, it was a moment, a real biopsy, a true revelation of the core of who we are as a people. It was altruism, pure and simple, and unselfishness, and it's still there. And I wanna say this, to all these people that are crying racism and all the, you know, this, these things, I, I was saying months ago, do not listen to the dividers, they are coming, because what I knew from my, I'm, I say this humbly, but I'm an expert on media incitement, and on anarchy because of this work for 25 years on researching uh, and exploring terrorism and mass destruction. And, and so there is a formula, and we can talk about it in a minute, that hasn't changed um, for 125 years. And you have, you have human predators, and, and I don't say that politically, because you can talk to any ER person whether they're extreme right or extreme left, and they will all tell you the same thing. We are responsible in the ER for confronting the Harvey Weinsteins of the world. The people who are human predators, who have a pathologic absence of conscience, who do not hurt when they hurt other people, who are monsters. Yeah, the Psych are, psychologically miswired. Yeah. They, they're born that way. You cannot treat them. It's not something, it's not a medical problem. It's something else. Yeah. And, and they are often very, very smart and they can become very wealthy and they are devious and dangerous and, and they will never be upfront with you about who they are. You have to, you have to be very sober that there are, there is a dark side to human nature. And, and so if we are not, if we have any 
political correctness about confronting the dark side and feeling bad about it, then people get hurt because you have elder abusers, sexual abusers, child abusers, rapists, murderers, you know, con men, you know, drug kingpins. We take care of all those people and we do it respectfully, but we're sober about the fact that there is a dark side. Not everyone has conscience and people of conscience find it impossible to imagine that those kinds of people exist and they are very vulnerable as a result. So what I've been saying is that what happened in the tragedy of the last few weeks with George Floyd, that had it not been for George Floyd, it would have been something else. That This whole thing was planned. Oh, this was a powder keg. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this it, was... but it was, it was not, it was premeditated. It yeah. was, the whole thing was executed with a very carefully thought out plan. It was manipulated and, and it was intentional. Mm-hmm. And it's not new. It uses the same formula that was invented 125 years ago on the streets of Paris during the Dreyfus affair. And, and so if, if, um, if I can segue for a moment to that, sure. um, is that okay? So in the course of making a documentary about 15 years ago, I became very, very interested in media incitement. What happened was that, that my, one of my best friends, I have two best friends, and this is one of them. They're both lawyers. And, and this particular person is a genius. His name is Reed Heller, is a photographic memory. And we did a thought experiment sitting in his uh, office at home. And we asked the question, well, where did terrorism and mass destruction come from? And so we went back in time from World War II and the Holocaust to World War I, to the Armenian massacre, to something called the Kishinev massacre, which was the first time that mass media was used to incite mass murder. And Kishinev is in what is now Moldova. Then it was part of Bessarabia on the western edge of the former Soviet Union. Then we went back to something called the Dreyfus Affair. Okay. And, and the, that happened in Paris. And it was the birthplace of all the techniques that we see today used by every single tyrant and every modern genocide since. And it is absolutely dependent upon mass media. So it's all based around a formula that's old, antiquated, unoriginal, uninspiring. And it's simply this. The formula is myth amplified by media to incite rage in crowds for power. Does that sound familiar? Oh yeah, very much so. So, so now here's the, the really interesting part that puts it all together. Why, uh, in fact, when we were talking before the show, you mentioned history repeats itself. And I, people often say this, and I say, well, yes and no, because this is not history repeating itself. It's new in the last 125 years. But so it sounds like then, more like it's an underlying principle, I guess, that's been no, able to keep going? Or? No, it's new. Well, it's new. It's, it's, a, it's a technology story. Sure. So we all can relate to how our lives and society has changed so drastically because of the exponential increase of scale of communication with Google, oh, yeah. smartphones, and uh, social media. I, I manage social media as a marketing business, and I tell people all the time, it's got its pros and it's got its cons, because yeah. you say something the wrong way, it happens so quick, so fast, it's, it's a nightmare sometimes. It's, yeah. yeah, and it's dehumanizing, and people don't realize how it's dehumanizing, because it, it, um, that's another story. But, but imagine that kind of experience, what we've been through in the last 20 years, 125 years ago, there was another revolution. And that revolution had to do with chlorine, with Clorox bleach, you know, mm-hmm. the, what we use for clothing. Sure. It wasn't called Clorox then. And nothing that was brand name. Company, Clorox. Yeah. yeah, sodium hypochlorite bleach. So what happened? In 1892, two years before the Dreyfus affair, for the first time in human history, it became possible for the words of a single person to reach millions in a single day. Now, it wasn't that the word of a single person couldn't reach millions before then. They had books and publishing and printing, but not in a single day. Not in a single day. Okay. 
And so why is that? Because what, uh, before 1892 and Clorox, paper was principally made from cotton, which could not be mass produced. But after, you, you could take wood, grind it up into pulp, bleach it, make newsprint, and newsprint plus web presses equal mass media. Okay. And so you have this ability to amplify the words of a single person to reach millions. And what happens in that, we don't think about it, is that the Amer what America is based around is a very, very simple set of principles that help us to remain human, which is that there is dark and light. You have the Harvey Weinsteins of the world and you have you know, the, the people who are, are selfless and inspired and un, you know, just advanced souls and everything in between. And the way we, we keep the balance is by reining in the dark side with checks and balances and transparency. And so peop, most people have conscience. And, and, and what is America? It's a place where we all, we disagree with each other. It's basically being different without killing each other. Uh, it's called, what, it's, what happened to good, healthy debate, right? It's, oh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not about loving each other, or even liking each other. It's, sure. it's about defending the right of someone you cannot stand to be who they are, even with your life. That's what America is, in my view, and that's what brings out all the altruism and the decency, because when that happens society-wide, you, it, it enables the greatest human potential and the ability to be free and to be who you are and express yourself. And, and you have that right as an American. It's imperfect. It was always imperfect. It will always be imperfect. Absolutely. But what happens with mass media is that it is impossible in most cases to have checks and balances and we don't even think about it. So here's an analogy. You go through the grocery store line. You make eye contact with the cashier. They smile back. There's an implied trust. And they're checking your stuff through. And out of the corner of your eye, you're kind of watching to make sure they're paying attention. Right. Did they double and scan then, something? Or? Yeah. Right. And at the end, you know, you smile. They smile. And, and the cashier says, 35 50 And you hand them 100 And they give you back five, smiling. With that same, you know, implied trust and sincerity, and you, you know, politely say no. It should be, you know, fifty-four fifty, or sixty-four, uh, sixty-four. Right where the math is, yeah. Yeah, and and they say no. They smile at you. No, it's five. And the, you're immediately able to measure that as something that's toxic. And you know there's something wrong with this person. And right. it's, there's something wrong with their smile, with their sincerity. There, there's something pathologic because people of conscience can't do that. Agreed. But human predators can because they don't feel pain when they lie, cheat, steal, masquerade, you know, when they're fraudulent. And they, they uh, are predators. They prey upon other people who can't imagine that such a human being can exist. So what do you do? You call the manager and the manager fires him or at least sorts out the problem. Right. Well, with mass media, you can't do that. And so you, you, it attracts predators who can masquerade as human. And, and when, when these types of people get their hands on mass media, unimaginable evil can occur. And, and they, it gives them tremendous power over the rest of us and an ability to conceal who they really are and what they are really up to. And it's very dangerous. And so I have a, a paradigm shift called radical transparency, yep. which is about, it's a new approach to protecting free speech while protecting society against human predators who use mass media to incite fear and rage in times like now when society is angry, exhausted, and afraid because they, they prey on these moments when, and they don't happen very often. They happen in war and famine and economic depressions. Or in a worldwide happen, pandemic when everybody's worldwide. mentally beat up. Exactly, where there's so much uncertainty, you're fighting a war against an enemy you can't see. 
you know, there's constant paranoia and People fear. Feel helpless. And, yeah, they feel, and, and they're afraid of the air we breathe, of the surfaces we touch, and of physical proximity to one another. And, and we've never imagined anything like this before. And by and large, what we've seen is tremendous stability and decency and altruism like we couldn't have imagined. It's reawakened the power of America in terms of this vast reservoir of human decency and goodness that's just beneath the surface. But this, what we just had was totally predictable because you have so many human predators that, that own mass media and that control mass media. And I don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist. No, this I, isn't a foil hat wearing thing. This is so, real. Yeah. So I, t yeah. I told you before we, we went on there that I am fortunate to own the largest private collection in the world of original mass media from the Dreyfus Affair. Wow. And this formula has been, you can see it, it's been around, it's not changed since the beginning. They, these human predators will tell, they'll, they'll tell anything to masses of people to create constituencies of rage that make them feel something, to feel alive, to feel, you know, purpose, to feel meaning. And, and they overwhelm individual conscience with rage and they transform people into weapons of mass destruction and turn civilized nations into what happened during the Holocaust. And, and it can happen even in advanced countries like America. America is not too big to fail. Oh, we're still so, all the same human beings, no matter what country we're, we're yeah, in. We have yeah. dark and light. And, yeah. and these ideas that we can perfect, you know, in fact, this, all this, this talk about defunding the police, what do, what do um, human predators do? They hate checks and balances. And so to the extent that that's one of the telltale signs, it, this was totally predictable because they want to create inertia around destroying checks and balances because that's the only thing between them uh, and and the power they want to achieve. I had a similar conversation yesterday with a friend of mine. He's uh, and it, it got promoted to an interim captain or chief or I forget it, but he just talked about how you know just a few weeks ago they they had people bringing you know gift food to the station you know to say thank you for everything you guys are doing for us, keeping everything you guys are out there on the front lines, just like the healthcare workers taking the risks. And then he's like, within an instant, all of a sudden everybody hates us again. And he's like, we haven't done anything different. And they're a small Nothing. local police department. So it's like, wow, it's, it's, it's yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah it, it is powerful. And it goes to the, the, to, to the danger of anything in our society, not just media, when there are no checks and balances. It applies to Google. It applies to Facebook, it, to YouTube, to any, anything without, with, with, without checks and balances. That's what America is. And, it, and America does not work without checks and balances because too much power is invested in the hands of too few and they're unelected. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a disaster waiting to happen every single time. Yeah. It's totally predictable. So, so what radical transparency is, let me tell you where I got the idea because it's not radical at all. It's totally doable. It's exactly what we do in the ER. And, and in medicine right now. Okay. Because you, so let's connect the dots. I'm, in, I'm intrigued. <laughs> okay. So, because you got, are you talking, you're referring to your Hippocratic Oath and all that? Or like, no, 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 no. It's federal law. We are required to sign disclosure forms every time we teach a class, yeah. every time we give a speech. If we have a dollar of stock in a company we're talking about where we are getting a dime from a pharmaceutical company, we have to disclose it. We can still say what we want, sure, but but it's different when people know in advance what your conflicts of interest are. So imagine right now if if media was required to reveal who was writing the talking points, what kind of outcomes they were trying to achieve and and manipulate yeah. and premeditate using media and myth. And also, if there were consequences for shamelessness. Well, imagine if they were if they were being transparent and said, "Well, listen, we're about to yeah. report on this, but we yeah. just heard about it five minutes ago. We haven't had a chance to really research it enough. So, just FYI, you know, like yeah, but, how but many times could they problems, do that? <laughs> if we know who owned things and who was running things and who was making the talking points, 
and who was you know what focus groups they were using and and also if if we, I, and this is not paranoia this is just human nature and checks and balances and what america is with transparency so if you know 102 years ago there was a supreme court ruling written by judge oliver wendell holmes on free speech and it was about shouting a shouting fire in a theater to create panic. Was that allowed or not? And it wasn't, it was outlawed. And so what you have now is a, a media that no one could have imagined that has become so powerful and so manipulative and so capable of creating myths that are totally untrue. And, and they're completely shameless about it because there are no consequences for being shameless. And so you cannot believe anything you hear in, today about COVID or very little you can hear. You know, a, a perfect example was, and I don't want to take too much time going on to the, you know, about talking about hydroxychloroquine, but there was, I'll just say. Oh, we have was, to do another whole podcast on that. <laughs> yeah. The, the Lancet, there was a study by the prestigious Lancet and it was just disgraced and pulled. And, and 10 days ago, I was on network television in Tampa saying that, Dr. Burks, who I think is a lovely person, that she must step down because she got on the podium, praised that study, and she didn't read it clearly because the study itself was saying, don't believe a word we're saying. And the whole thing turned out to be an utter sham. Wow. It was a con game. Total farce. Yeah. And, and it cost human lives. So, so now do you want to talk about humidity? It's a sure. good segue. I mean... As long as we don't have to go too long, I'm just I'm just do a time check for you. You're still good, but yeah. I mean, we're going to be we got about 10, 15 minutes because I have another show right after this. So okay, yeah. all right. So I'll make this quick, yeah. or I'll, I'll try. So this is what I'm involved with right now in trying to create grassroots movements um, to quickly make indoor air all across the country what I call green, which is humidity between 50 and 60 percent round the clock. So there's a missing link to the COVID story. And, and, I, and I'm going to say something that I, would, I wasn't saying over the past several months. Now I'm just going to say it because I believe it. We, we've been lied to about this, this whole pandemic. And, and it's cost lives and it's destabilized the country. And in all likelihood, had the president known, whether you love him or hate him, He's a man of action. Had he known about this at the beginning, we, we likely could have avoided or largely avoided the shutdown of the country and saved tens of thousands of lives. So it turns out, you remember James Carville had that great saying during the Clinton election, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah. Remember that? And oh, everyone yeah. knows what you're talking about. It's the economy, stupid. So the words that should be on the tip of everyone's tongue, words of hope with COVID is it's the weather stupid. Yeah. It's the weather stupid because it turns out that I believe when you look at every single hotspot, now what we're talking about with a hotspot is where a small viral outbreak becomes a massive COVID bomb. Like over in China, in those, a couple of those cities. Over in China, example. Detroit, New York City, New Orleans, Washington yeah. State, you know, and, and smaller versions of that since. And they're usually... Um, in one of four places, nursing homes, prisons, meatpacking plants, and cruise ships. Has anyone, oh, I'm going to go off track here. So, so I want to make the point that it's the weather that caused every single one of those hotspots to explode. Okay. Here's why. Because buildings breathe. Yes. And, and so there is something called the absolute humidity. It's not the relative humidity, which is what is reported on the weather service and measured at home. Yeah. It's, it's the actual amount of water in the air. And you can listen to a Scientific American 60-second podcast that will tell you from 2009 that we've been looking at the wrong thing all along. Mm -hmm. This knowledge is not new. Burks and Fauci should have known this as virologists. And, and so the absolute humidity is directly correlated to indoor viral danger. And, and if it's um, a certain number outside, you can predict what the air will be inside. 
So what happens is that in every single hotspot, the air was dangerously dry indoors. In that condition, COVID spreads like wildfire. It's like a blasting cap with an arson, or like an accelerant with an arsonist okay. that, that sets off a fire. When you don't have that, COVID is fragile and doesn't do well. Okay, so let me give you the, um, the, the three big points about why we've been lied to. First of all, and, and this is a sidebar, but it's important. African Americans have not been told that the higher death rates are not just due to inner city poverty and co pre existing conditions related to, to poverty. There's also a genetic vulnerability that makes African Americans at risk of higher death rates. That's one. Secondly, we have not been told that COVID outbreaks do not occur outdoors. I don't know of a single case. I agree with that of any outdoor outbreak. And look at all these riots and mobs and no one wearing masks and social distancing. Yeah. There is no uptick. And, and that's partly, that's because in outdoor air, you, virus spreads differently than indoor air. It's diluted very quickly. Absolutely. And, and so viral transmission is different and, and the viral viability. Remember, viruses do not live. They're not like bacteria. They're not organisms. I train on this. They, they have infectivity that lasts for a certain amount of time, and the infection, the infectivity is much shorter outdoors. So, um, so outdoors and indoors are different. Okay, so there are three conditions that are required to have an outbreak become a bomb. Okay, and one is high population density indoors. Indoors. Second is virus, COVID in particular. Third is dangerously dry indoor air. And when you put those three together, it gets very dangerous. The beauty is that it's completely predictable. And so I'm lobbying hard to, have, to get a meeting at the White House with the three big weather data providers, which is the Weather Channel owned by an African-American billionaire, Byron Allen, AccuWeather, which about two weeks ago came out with a product that's vaguely similar to the viral safety index. It does different things, but it shows us that the technology to do this is, is there. And the third is IBM, which owns Weather Underground. And so the viral right, safety- I'm a heavy index, user of Weather Underground. So it's a, the viral safety index is, is a call to action and a plan to keep us safe. And, and it enables you to, for, it enables you to, be warned in advance when dangerously dry indoor air occurs in time for you to make red air green. And what is green air? It's just humidity between 50 and 60% indoors around the clock. And when, when you do that, COVID doesn't do well and it's going to flatten the curve and, and it's going to protect us in the fall, especially people with pre-existing conditions, older people, African-Americans, um, every anyone that's at risk. Well, I tell you that now with all the companies I train from the the uh, UV disinfection standpoint inside of HVAC systems. That's one of the biggest product lines I train on with my client uh, for her clients. And I tell people all the time, like guys, like IAQ indoor air quality. That's just one component. I always, I always tell people I can't address the humidity. I, I don't work with those companies. There's companies who specifically manufacture products to help ensure a certain balance of humidity within your HVAC system. So it's, it's so yeah. easy to fix. Mm -hmm. I, w I went up to Cincinnati for a press conference on May 31st with the sheriff and the police chief and the president of the police union. We had to cancel it because of the violence, but, but it turns out just by serendipity, I was on a radio show up there and I get this call from the police uh, chief president or the police union president, thousand members, and said, you know, I heard um, the first thing that made sense to me about COVID because we had an instinct here in Cincinnati months ago that outdoors were different than indoors and the police chief had the wisdom to create policies that encouraged officers to police outdoors. And we had the lowest infection rate of any large city police force in Ohio. Then he calls me back and he'd heard me talk about nursing homes, prisons, meatpacking plants. And he said, you mean to say that, that we could actually 
make prisons safe by raising the humidity. And he remembered that the Hamilton County Jail, which is one of the largest jails in the country, largest hundred jails in the country, had zero COVID cases. Interesting. So he calls the sheriff, said, Sheriff, what's the humidity? I don't know. Really wonderful guy. His name is Sheriff Jim Neal. I've gotten yeah. to know him. And then he, call, he finds out that it was 52% round the clock. They've had now, zero. Now, was that being managed by their, their, that was actually part of their system? It was an accident. Yeah. Yeah, they just had, whoever said it, said it in the Nailed green it right. Yeah. Thank goodness. And then, so on the way up there, I have a special device to measure absolute humidity, this metric that's key to uh, uh, viral safety indoors. I measured it in Terminal C at DFW. Term DFW is one of the world's largest airports. Yep. You know, it's a, a city under roof. You know, and it is massive. I've been there many times. Okay, so guess what? The humidity in DFW Terminal C was better than the Cincinnati jail. Wow. It's probably the safest place in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, and no one knows it. Then I land in Cincinnati, measure the indoor air at CVG Airport Covington. It's what Wuhan was at the worst in December when the viral bomb went off. A tale of two cities. If DFW Airport can make indoor air green, then any place in the world can make indoor air green. And I would venture a guess that it's as easy as flipping a switch in many cases or resetting yes. a yeah. dial. Yes. So uh, I, every can, I, can, I can back it up because I, I've been working and working and training and representing companies in the HVAC sector for indoor air quality for going on seven, eight years. My client, her company is what is involved with that. She's been doing it for over 12 years. And yes, I tell people all the time, like your IAQ is so important. Um, so you have to understand these components, humidity, dehumidification. People don't understand that, you know, now it's getting hot out. If you do have AC systems installed, your air conditioning naturally through the cooling process is pulling moisture out of the air. So that's why sometimes, great, you've added you know, a nice high end, you know, HVAC system, great cooling, you're, you know, it's 90 degrees outside, you got 70, 75 degrees inside or whatever you decide to set it at. But then there's a possibility that you may pull too much moisture out of the air, which is why companies make uh, humidification devices to add into the exactly. ductwork to so keep that balance. And expensive and can be done. It, it's you can put it on autopilot and then you're safe. Yeah. And it's all managed by your thermostat, everything else. So okay, so we went through the ventilators, PPE. You know, it was the, they used the the War Powers Act. We need another wartime footing between now and the fall to get every First of all, every nursing home, long-term care facility, every prison, every meatpacking plant, every hospital at 50 to 60% round the clock. Sure. And we need every school, every mall, every fire station, every police station, every restaurant, salon, barbershop, retail, home in America, 50 to 60%. It's urgent. It is urgent and it's safe. And, and what if I'm wrong? So we have safe, comfortable indoor air. I was saying, if you're wrong, cancer. your air quality got better. So that's got better. Darn, yeah. You know, yeah. which is important because people don't understand that. Like I have a house built in 1910. My house breathes naturally very well. Newer construction, modern engineering and architectural feats and, and modern energy efficiency codes and all this new stuff has tightened uh, buildings up and, because they want to control the atmosphere better from within and not be influenced from the outside. That's great and all, but that needs to be even more important that you have to focus on your indoor air quality and how yeah. all these calculations are, are put in It's place. critically important, especially at night, because we have, and, and no one's talking about this. Do you have time for, for me to just explain about? I got five minutes, yeah, so rock and roll. Okay, so, yeah. so, <laughs> so why does humidity work indoors? So what may be the most important thing is what I call Kevlar against COVID. And it's something as a doctor, I hadn't thought about in year, I barely ever knew about it in the first place, but it turns out that we have a natural protective barrier that starts at the tip of our nose and our mouth and goes all the way deep into our lungs. And it's the mucus on mucous membranes. And so it does, there are three things, and there are probably more, but three things that I know about. There are glycoproteins that form a protective barrier that are like Kevlar in a sense, don't allow the virus in. 
the second thing is that we have cilia, which is a transport mechanism, little hairs that, that, that bring, it's like a, a conveyor belt that bring the virus from deep inside out. And third is an entire armamentarium of about 300 different genes. In fact, if you have show notes, I can send you some links that people can. Okay, I'll send you send links. Send them to the and, show. Yeah, yeah. I'll have my VA put and, them into the blog article because people do a whole blog article for you. So. So, so Yale, actually, there's a scientist from Yale who does a beautiful job of explaining that there are 300 different genes. And it's, she talks about flu, but it's a year ago, but it's all relative to today. Um, that there are genes that produce interferon that go after the virus. So it make, when the mucus is moist, it's optimized and it works. When it dries, it doesn't work. And so that's why when it's a super dry day or if you live in Arizona or you're going out into dry air or it's dry in your house, hydrate. It's very important. Drink water, or, but you don't want to drink too much water because you can develop water toxicity. Drink all the Gatorade or Powerade or you know, Pedialyte you want, but you stay hydrated and that's like portable humidity for your mucus layer. The other thing that happens indoors is that when the air is moist, virus, it, it hits a firewall. It doesn't go very far because there's friction in the air. Right. And so in, in dry air, it can go all the way across, across a room and last for hours. In moist air, it doesn't go very far and doesn't last very long. I tell people all the time, like, when that air feels heavy, it's, yeah. that's the moisture. Well, you don't even need it that high. No, no. no, you, no. It's just comfortable. 50 to 60%, it's just comfortable. You don't even know it. It's there, but it's... It, that's it's invisible safety that comes from green air. And the third is on surfaces. We, you know, have heard about going to the grocery store, touching something, coming home into the sacred space of our home, touching something and contaminating our home. When you have green air, surface virus is less likely to dry out, get into the air and into your lungs. Sure. And so, so please tell everyone you love, you care about, you know, for yourself, even if you live alone, humidify your indoor air and, and tell store owners and everyone that we're on a mission. Forget about that, the fact that we're getting, you know, it seems like the COVID crisis is passing because it isn't. We just have a lull because when you go from winter to spring to summer, you get more green days than red, but you can still have red hours in the middle of summer. New Orleans is a perfect example. The last place you would think you'd have a COVID catastrophe because it's so darn humid all the time. Yeah. Guess what? On the two peak days of Mardi Gras this year, there was a weather system that came through, made the, the air dangerously dry indoors, and people were packed in the French Quarter. Some, had, some people had COVID, and, and one person with COVID can spread, and I, can, I learned this this weekend, 100 billion, with a B, 100 billion viral particles per day. But to your point, you have to have the environment to help support that, right? You, 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 well, you, it only happens indoors, in dangerously dry indoor air. Right. So everyone needs to get on a mission. In fact, for churches all over the country, I'm helping them to start a holy war against the virus using the weapon of indoor humidity. So it's the only offensive weapon we have against COVID until we get a vaccine. I, I've said since the beginning, I was glad to see that they made HVAC contractors uh, an essential business because I sell people, tell me, if you're going to be trapped indoors, take your indoor air quality seriously. Have the humidity, I've been saying this for months, have the humidity checked, have everything looked at. You don't necessarily and, have to throw in a UV system, but to yeah. your point, right? Humidity. Buy that's, a $10 that's hygrometer. It's HYG, not HYD, hygrometer on Amazon or Walmart, or, and you can see a real-time readout of your indoor humidity. There you go. And if you buy a cheap humidifier, I have a couple of my bottom used, I'm cheap, on Amazon. And it, but put the hygrometer 10 or 15 feet away from the, the humidifier so you're getting a real-time reading of the actual diluted air, you know, what, what the humidity is out from the humidifier. Right. And do it 24-7 because at night is the time of greatest risk when your air, your lungs dry out. Okay. So 
I hope this has been helpful, Scott. Oh, it's been a great tip. I usually ask somebody to leave something powerful behind, but that I think you nailed it. <laughs> well, I, it will save lives and help save the economy if we do this. We have to do it. I have and to admit, last, I never. Thing. Go ahead. Can I just share one last thing? It's about the airline industry because I'm, I'm, I'm issuing a call to action to the airline industry. So we will never get green air in aircraft cabins. True. But guess what? You don't need it. What all these draconian measures from the CDC about six foot social distancing, they're not based on real science. They're, they're, they are um, creating, you know, uh, a false sense of security. <laughs> well, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's actually, they're fear mongering and they're creating um, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, new normal of fear, which is not a new normal at all. And, and so, what I'm saying is that one size doesn't fit all, fit all when it comes to COVID risk. Outdoor air is different than indoor air. And it turns out that pressurized air in aircraft is much different than air in a nursing home because the air is constantly moving. And so I've asked many aviation and aircraft experts, editors in chief of big publications. I was with the vice president of safety of one of the largest airlines in the world last Thursday. Everyone answers the same answer to this question. Do you know of a single case where a person gets on an airliner with COVID, like back in February, coming out of China or Europe, and infects a cluster of people on the airline? Do you, have you heard of any cases, no. Scott? I haven't either. And I think there's a reason for it. And I think that it, it, it turns out that aircraft cabins right now, for reasons we probably don't completely understand, are probably the safest, one of the safest places to be against COVID because the air is constantly moving and it's designed actually to have separation between one person sitting right next to another. Right. And they have HEPA filters that do a better job than an N100 mask at filtering out viral particles from the air and high turnover. So think about that. Yeah. I hope that helps. I like that. Well, listen, Doc, it's been great. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank you. It's an honor to be on lot, your show. A lot of uh, mind-blowing knowledge tonight. And actually, uh, I didn't think you and I would come together so easily on the HVAC and humidification and IAQ. So that was fun. So uh, I hope you had some fun tonight as well. And Thank uh, th you. thanks for you all your too. hard work. And I would actually do one last screen share, and then I got to hop on the other call. But I, I was already Googling stuff. So reminding people, if you do get down to Washington, D.C., I mean, here's um, – this is great. Diversity.com was actually talking about the exhibit. So here's here's a yeah. piece right here. Um, uh, I, I guess their exhibit is they are they calling it "We Return Fighting." So oh, that's the name of it. We return fighting the African American experience of World War One. There you go. And open through September six. It's been extended. Awesome. Well, this is thank powerful. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Gusky. All the best. And uh, I'll let you go. I'll close this out, ladies and gentlemen. That's another powerful Live the Fuel show. Dr. Gusky, dropping some serious bombs, do the research, take accountability for your health, uh, take humidity in your indoor air quality very seriously. Uh, he just helped justify that multiple times over. So again, we're here to fuel your health, your business, your lifestyle. And Dr. Gusky definitely helped us do that today. So thanks for tuning in. And remember, you too can live the fuel, and we'll talk to you guys again soon. Thank you. Thank you.